My name is Jason Bisecki, and I'm a second year full-time MBA student at UCLA Anderson and a vice president of the Greater China Business Association. I'm also the student co-director of today's conference together with my classmate, Longing Zhang. It is a great honor for me to open the 12th Wilbur K. Wu Greater China Business Conference this afternoon. We are delighted to have everyone join us here today. I hope that you will take the time to learn and interact with the business leaders from various sectors and disciplines that we have brought together today and share their thoughts and insights on the changing dynamics, implications, and future of the US-Sino relationship. I would like to extend a special thank you to all of our guests and moderators and acknowledge some of the past student conference directors who have joined us for today's event. I would also like to thank and recognize our platinum sponsors, PwC and Cathay Bank, our silver sponsor, Lansay, and our bronze sponsor, Cox, Castle, and Nicholson. We thank all of our sponsors for their continued to support and commitment to the conference. I would also like to acknowledge the conference organizers, the UCLA Anderson's Center for Global Management, UCLA Anderson's Greater China Business Association, and the UCLA Chinese Students and Scholars Association, CSSA, who have all worked hard to bring this conference to you. We are also grateful for the support of the China General Chamber of Commerce, Los Angeles, the UCLA Asia Pacific Center, and the Center for Chinese Studies. And of course, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to the Wu family, whose generosity enables us to present this conference each year. Represented here today by Michael Wu, son of Wilbur and Beth Wu, who before their passing endowed the Wilbur K. Wu Greater China Business Conference at UCLA Anderson to show their gratitude for the training that Wilbur received here at his alma mater many years ago. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Good afternoon, my name is Long Ying Zhang. As Jason mentioned, I've been working alongside him as a student co-director for today's conference. I would like to take this opportunity to thank and welcome Judy Olian, Dean and John E. Anderson Chair in Management at UCLA Anderson. Dean Olian has been a tremendous supporter of the conference over the years. Since her appointment in 2006, she has greatly strengthened UCLA Anderson's focus on international business and global management, develop targeted partnerships with an emphasis in Asia, particularly the greater China region and advanced and strengthened UCLA Anderson into one of the leading schools of management in the world with a truly global focus. It was also under Dean Olian's leadership that the Center for Global Management was established here at UCLA Anderson. Please join me in thanking and welcoming the Dean of UCLA Anderson, Dean Judy Olian. Thank you both, and these are examples of the wonderful student organizers of this uh, conference. Um, so thank you for all of the collaboration. This is our 12th uh, Wu China conference. We're, we're thrilled that we have continued this tradition. And it's one of Anderson's signature events, uh, a, a, a real collaborative effort between our students our faculty, the Center for Global Management, and Lucy Allard, our executive director, and a number of student associations on campus, UCLA's China Student and Scholars Association. So it's, it's really a, a labor of love, what we call sharing success. It's also a collaboration with the private sector, and Jason mentioned our, our sponsors here. Um, it's more than just an Anderson tradition, it's become an annual assessment of the current conditions in US-China uh, economic relationships and the continuing evolution of cross-border business and investment across the two largest economies of the world. The goal today is not to present a single vision of the condition of the relationships, nor a partisan point of view, and I'm sure one can easily gravitate into that, but we won't, Rather, it's to view the complex economic relationships and conditions through a prism that includes government policy, economic analysis, private sector actions and reactions through the goals of major corporations and the latest startup ventures. 
When this conference began 12 years ago, the topic of the day then was US investment in China. Later, later on, we looked at cross-border investments between the two countries, a more of a reciprocal relationship. And today, the focus is mainly on inbound Chinese investments in the United States, how times have changed over those 12 years. The most recent Wu conference, held a year ago, looked at what was then being called a new chapter for US-China relationships, examining investments, growth strategies, and opportunities for all forms of collaboration between business uh, leaders on both sides of the Pacific. Trade relations between China and the US are top of mind for both economies, for both countries, with talks of tariffs, deficits, and uh, various deals uh, in the headlines. Nothing new there. We recently did some archival searches of our own um, records and came across an old issue of what was called the GSM Quarterly, a long discontinued newsletter published by what was then known as UCLA's Graduate School of Management, hence GSM, Graduate School of Management. The cover story for the winter 1977 issue was Sino-American Trade. The lead of the article posed what was then a very pertinent question. Will Americans be watching Monday Night Football on red Chinese television sets a few years from now? That's a direct quote. Remember, we used to call it Red China. The answer provided by Professor Barry Richmond went on as follows, and remember this is 1977. You may well see color television sets from China within the next five years. They're producing them now, but they're talking about producing them for mass markets. If they did, they could undersell the Japanese. In fact, and this is Barry Richmond talking, I think you'll see some of the same imports here that you saw after World War II from Japan and Korea. Think about it. No Chinese machines, technologies, televisions at the time. Professor Richmond, who just received a grant to study US-China trade relations, went on to wonder whether or not China would abandon its traditional model of self-reliance in favor of a rapid, long-term infusion of foreign capital and technology to meet the pressing economic requirements of modernization. Imagine how things have changed in, uh, what is it, uh, 40 years, 40 years. I mean, I, I challenge you to go through a whole day without picking up a Chinese product or component in what you use on a regular basis. Professor Richmond then noted that such a move that was expanding globally would push the level of US-Chinese trade from $1 billion per year to $3 billion. Four decades later, our faculty continue to partner with foundations and financial institutions to study the complex economic relationship between China and the US, most recently a partnership between UCLA and Cathay Bank. Thank you. The first report to come out of this uh, new partnership was authored by our forecast director, Professor Jerry Nicholsberg, and economist William Yu, who will be talking about some of that later on today. Uh, in that report, by the way, it notes that China has become United States' largest trading partner with total trade amounting to, and I remind you that there was a prediction of going from one to three billion in 1977. Today, the trade amounts to $636 billion, a little far from three. Uh, the report goes on to detail many of the issues I'm sure you're going to be looking at today. Key among them is the significance of trade deficits. The U.S. trade deficit with China is $375 billion, accounting for 47% of the total U.S. trade deficit. So almost half of the U.S. trade deficit is with one country alone, China. 
and also concerns regarding Chinese acquisition of US intellectual properties, especially through the purchase of American companies, while not allowing the US uh, and US companies to compete in China with similar technology. We all know that the Chinese-US trade relations are a central cornerstone, not just for the US's economy, but for the global economy. And that's why this conference is such a vitally important forum for discussion and understanding of these issues. With this conference, we honor the legacy of Wilbur Wu, who, along with his wife Beth, endowed the event to promote understanding and economic ties between Greater China and the United States. And this conference has, I think, lived up to that legacy over the 12 years. Mr. Wu, and I was fortunate to get to know him uh, before he died, a special, special person and visionary. Mr. Wu rose to be executive vice president of Cathay Bank, which was the first Chinese-American owned bank in the US. He also served as chairman of the Chinese Times, which is the oldest Chinese language newspaper in the US, was chairman of several Asian-focused business and trade groups, was grand president of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, which lobbied for the historic immigration reform bill of the mid-60s that opened the doors to an entire new wave of immigrants from China and Taiwan. Uh, he graduated in 1942 from UCLA with a bachelor's in business. He received uh, the UCLA Neil Jacoby Award in 1996 for contributions to international relations. Um, we thank Wilbur and the Wu family. We thank PwC and Cathay Bank, the platinum sponsors. And with us today, uh, who will speak a little bit later, is Mr. Pin Tai, the CEO and president of Cathay General Bank Corps and Cathay Bank. And we'll, we'll look forward to hearing from you. Let me introduce Michael Wu, the progeny of Wilbur in, in the fullest sense of the word. Uh, he is the son of Wilbur, the dean of the College of Environmental Design at Cal Poly Pomona, which is a leading school producing architects, landscape architects, urban planners, and graphic designers who primarily work in California. He was elected to the LA Council, City Council, and he served eight years as the representative of Hollywood and the surrounding neighborhoods. And he continues to be active in many community affairs. I'll just mention a couple. He's interim president of the LA County Grand Park Foundation Board of Directors, which is promoting the new downtown uh, park between the Music Center and City Hall, which will be a major addition to downtown. Previously, he chaired the boards of the Hollywood Farmers Market, Smart Growth America, and Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center, and he was a member of the very important LA City Planning Commission. Like his father, Michael is a product of the UCs. He earned his BA in Politics and Urban Studies from UC Santa Cruz, and his Masters of uh, City Planning from UC Berkeley. So very much a UC uh, brethren. Um, at UCLA, Anderson, we're especially grateful to Michael and his family for continuing this important tradition of the conference. And his wife is here, and I want to give a shout out to Laurie. Where's Laurie? There you are. Hi, Laurie. Um, Laurie Dowling. She's a, a great friend of UCLA Anderson for uh, when I first got here. She was the head of our executive programs and set it off on a great path. So welcome back, Laurie, and welcome, Michael. Thank you for everything. Uh, thank you so much, Dean Olean, for those kind words of introduction. For people in the audience, if you're ever looking for a crutch in terms of a way to win over goodwill from strangers, the only thing that's better than having crutches is having a dog. Uh, but otherwise, this, uh, this works pretty well. I can assure you this is only temporary. I, I slipped and fell at work and broke a bone in my ankle about six weeks ago, and I'm about a week away from losing my, my cast. 
which will enable me to uh, drive a car again. But, uh, but if any of you need technical assistance figuring out how to take public transportation between Union Station and Pomona, I would be happy to share my, my new wisdom with you. I'd like to say a word, first of all, thanking Long Ying and Jason for their hard work and also all the other MBA students who helped to make this conference such a huge success. I remember years ago when a senior associate dean, Al Osborne, suggested that the best way to run this conference would be to put the students in charge. Uh, initially, my dad was a little skeptical, but it's turned out to be a fantastic success. So to Long Ying and to Jason, thank you for helping to do it. I, I had the good fortune to sit next to Jason at dinner last night. I asked him a question about whether he, in hindsight, thought he had made the right decision to study Chinese and not Arabic. And uh, Jason said that at this point in his career, he still thinks that choosing Chinese was the right choice. So good luck to you, Jason, and thank you to the MBA students. To Dean Olian, I want to express our family's deep gratitude for your 12 years of, of uh, faithful support of this conference. Um, Connecticut's gain is the Anderson School's loss as Dean Olean goes on to her next position as a college president. But she has done so much to help globalize the Anderson School, not just traveling frequently to China and to other, point, other destinations in Asia, but also uh, helping to infuse the importance of the international scene here at the Anderson School and creating so many partnerships and opportunities for Anderson students to learn how to be effective. So, to Dean Olean, thank you so much for all you've done, not just supporting this conference, but helping to persuade Anderson students that you're part of a larger world. And to the speaker who comes after me, Mr. Pin Tai, thank you so much to Cathay Bank. Um, I, I want to point out that in my college at Cal Poly Pomona, we include a very large program in graphic design. And I want you to notice right over here, on the screen, the brand new logo for Cathay Bank. Uh, I know that our faculty would have said, this is a really good logo, not just because you figured out how to combine the C and the B, but also the fact that they figured this out and, and trademarked it before Coldwell Banker thought of the same thing. <laughs> But apart from that, also, uh, I want to say thank you for the good news in terms of stock prices. That's very encouraging, and it's great to know that Cathay Bank chooses to give back to the community by supporting this conference, which is so much in keeping with my father's intentions. I, I'm sorry that so many of you have never had a chance or didn't have a chance to meet my father while he was alive. He was a real people person. He loved meeting people. He was curious about people. And I think that was one of the ways in which he was valuable to Cathay Bank, especially in the early days, in the 1960s, when Cathay Bank was not just the first Chinese American bank, but one of the very few uh, working out of a, a tiny storefront on North Broadway in Chinatown. So it's hard to realize that when you see the map of Cathay Bank now with all these dots on the map with branches all over the world. But at that point, it was just a small storefront. Uh, to be honest with you, when he got started, my father did not have a strong background in banking. He did, I remember when I was a teenager, he did try to take some night courses to try to study up so that he would have credibility in the banking world. But one of the ways in which he did bring value to the bank was his people skills, his ability to connect with people, the role he played in the community. And to give you a sense of what he was like, um, one thing that he really taught uh, members of our family was uh, the importance of a work ethic. Dad really believed in being on time, uh, not missing appointments. And somehow, uh, somehow that did not get passed down in the genes to me. I, I tend to take more after my mother, who has more of the had more of the attitude, there must be time for one more. Uh, but Dad really believed in being on time, not being late. Some of this had to do with the fact that during many of the key years of his career, 
he not only worked at Cathay Bank and led what were then called bankers' hours starting at about 9 o'clock, but we also had a family business for over 40 years, a wholesale produce market down in the city market area of downtown L.A., where he had to show up for work at midnight, which is when the trucks came in, you know, from the farms to make deliveries, and then supermarkets and airlines would come in to pick up things and take the fruits and vegetables out. Um, I think one of the reasons why I turned to politics instead of the produce industry was because I didn't think I could handle the hours that my dad was leading going to work around midnight or one or two in the morning. Then, when that was knocking off at about eight or nine in the morning, then dad would go, go over to Cathay Bank and start his other, his other job at the bank, and, and fortunately, the bank closed at about 3 o'clock. So then he had some time to take a nap for a few hours. But the other point I was going to make is, as a, as a role model for others in our family, he and my mother and my grandfather demonstrated that it is possible to also have a business career, but also be involved in the community. You heard from Dean Olean about the, my, my dad's side responsibilities. For a couple of years, he was the national president of the first Chinese American civil rights organization at a time when immigration issues were heating up. I remember him coming back when I was a teenager talking about the thrill of going to Washington, testifying to a subcommittee chaired by Ted Kennedy that was trying to figure out what should be in the immigration reform bill that ultimately ended up opening the door for more immigrants coming from China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, the, the vast Chinese diaspora that transformed Monterey Park, Alhambra, San Gabriel, Rosemead, Walnut, Diamond Par, and points eastward. Uh, and, and so it, it, is, it is very instructive to realize, and a lesson I think for many uh, Anderson students, that while you're really focused on what you're going to do using your MBA, uh, don't forget that you also have an obligation to try to give back and be part of the community. And that there are examples out there, whether it's Wilbur Wu or somebody else, who can show you you can have a very successful private career, but also don't forget to be a part of the community. So I hope, I'm sorry you didn't get a chance to meet him, but I get to bring you his message. And so, um, again, thank you all for making this conference such a success after 12 years. And, and uh, once again, I see a really good turnout, so I'm very encouraged about that. So please join with me in welcoming and expressing our gratitude to the CEO and president of Cathay Bank, Mr. Pin Tai. Good afternoon. I want to thank uh, Dean Orlean and Michael for the nice introduction. Uh, it is really my great pleasure to be here today. Uh, Cathay Bank is proud to support the Wu Pei Wu uh, Greater China Conference, Business Conference, and commence the great work this conference has achieved since it first started in 2007. And Mr. Wu Pei Wu is very near and dear in our hearts in Cathay. Uh, Mr. Wu was one of the original members of our executive management team, and he helped lay down the foundation which Cathay has built its success on. Cathay was founded in 1962 when the banking landscape was very different from today. At that time, there were very few Chinese-American residents and businesses, and the lack of understanding of this market segment made it very difficult for Chinese Americans to obtain credit. Cathay Bank's founding mission is to serve the banking needs of the Chinese American community in Los Angeles. And the waves of immigration in the 1980s, start from Taiwan, then Hong Kong, and later from mainland China, and the growing trade between the US and Greater China has fueled much of the growth and success of Cathay Bank. And today, Cathay Bank, through its bank holding company, Cathay General Bangkok, is a publicly traded company on NASDAQ with a market capital of $3.2 billion and total assets of about $16 billion. We have 65 branches uh, across nine states uh, in the United States and in Hong Kong and rep representative office in Shanghai, Beijing, and Taipei. And this year, we 
We are rated by Ford Magazine as the number 12 best bank in America among the publicly traded banks in the United States. And just as this conference has updated itself through the years to remain timely, I'm pleased to share our new brand logo with you today. And in fact, I'm wearing the new logo pin we just came out yesterday. <laughs> so you may be confused when you look at our logo uh, in the screen versus the book. Book and book is different. So that explains why. And after 56 years, we have refreshed our looks while maintaining our continued commitment to our customers and community. The purpose of this conference is to bring together different experiences and ex perspectives on the relationship between U.S. and Greater China, create meaningful networking opportunities, and to inspire our leaders of the future. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, China is the biggest trading partner for the United States, with total trading volume of $636 billion in 2017, which accounts for 16.4% of the U.S. total international trade. Besides trading, China outbound foreign direct investment to the United States reached a historical high level of $44.6 billion in 2006, uh, with $25.7 billion in California and $15.7 billion in New York, making these two states the most popular investment destinations and helping the local economies prosper. In addition, the number of international tourists from China keeps growing every year, reaching 4, B, 4 million in 2017. And Chinese tourists have very strong buying power. They spend over 97 million every day, creating about 554,000 jobs in the United States. In the 2016 to 2017 school year, there were more than 355,000 Chinese students studying in the United States, making it the top original country for international students, bringing about $15.9 billion of economic impact. California, as a state hosting the most international students, have benefited $6 billion from international student contribution from China. Given that China is one of the top U.S. trading partner and also investors, and undoubtedly plays an important role in the U.S. economy, President Trump's recent tariff proposals have raised some concerns. Whereas economists, having weighed in on the potential impact this proposal may have on U.S.-China trade, and I look forward to the discussions today from various experts and professionals on how the U.S.-China relationship may evolve. And thank you.